Um, well, I think we need AI to kind of manage all the all the chairs up here. Right? When, when is uh, ChatGPT going to be able to fabricate a chair on the on the chair stage? General? I'm Larry Tab. I am uh, head of market structure research at Bloomberg, um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. We're going to be talking about AI and investment management. It's a, a really interesting topic, and AI has been around in finance for for a very long time. You know. In, in the 80s at Lehman, I, we were playing around with it, never really went anywhere, but that's besides the point. But now we're actually getting somewhere. Um, one of the first things I want to do is have everybody introduce themselves. Um, we'll, we'll start with Allison and kind of how you're you know, related to AI. Thanks, Larry. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. My name is Allison Rooney. Um, I head up our global partnerships for capital markets where I focus on solving our biggest challenges in capital markets, leveraging our ISV community, and um, have been focusing a lot on emerging technology, including partners in AI, uh, blockchain, and certainly some of our friends in the legacy space. And um, I'm excited to be here. Jake. Hi, everyone. My name is Jake Katz, and I'm the head of non-agency RMBS research and data science at the London Stock Exchange Group Analytics. I've been interacting with AI throughout my entire career there, in the first capacity through improving our data flows and our disparate data capture, in the second capacity, generating metrics, data-driven metrics for sale. And now with the explosion of large language models and chatbots, but actually increasing the efficiency and comfort around user workflow. Peter? Hi there, good morning. Uh, I think it's still morning. Oh, it? no, Barry. Uh, morning, it, uh, I'm Barry Starr, CEO of Wall Street Horizon. Uh, for those who don't know, Wall Street Horizon were the uh, gold standard for providing forward-looking corporate event data to investment investment managers around the world. Um, been doing this a long time. Happy to talk about it. Um, you asked how uh, you know we get involved with AI. We actually use the tools a lot in our company. We never talk about it because people don't care. What people really care about is accurate data, accurate, accurate, accurate data, and AI machine learning, those types of tools are just tools that we use to get there. Peter? Hi, I'm uh, Peter Marber. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for Emerging Markets. I'm a career asset manager, been on the street for over 30 years. And uh, I've also been a, a professor. And uh, in the spring, I did publish a book on AI and the future of learning and work. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, some of the panelists mentioned, AI has been around the investment universe for a while. Um, what's interesting to me is that we really see it now creeping up in so many different areas, everything from research to actual trading to filling out uh, due diligence questionnaires and RFPs. It's really becoming much more ubiquitous. And I'm sure the launch of ChatGPT and the large language models, we're just going to see it every day, everywhere in all aspects of the business. Interesting. Um, uh, I last. I'm Harry Mandel. Uh, I work for the New York Federal Reserve. They require me to say that everything that I say following this is my thoughts and ideas, not necessarily those of the Fed. Um, I'm the uh, AI architect for the New York Federal Reserve and have been working in that area for quite a while. Our first application was a bank supervision program we call LEX which goes through all the documents that we receive and looks for things that examiners uh, want to use. It was a little more than a POC until COVID, and then they relied on it for the continuous monitoring of all the banks. So we went from having eight to 80 users in about six month period, and it's in full production and expanding. Uh, we also use AI for synthetic data generation which is very useful for us because as we're moving, we're still a little behind, moving things from on-prem into the cloud. We have uh, worries about security. So if we generate synthetic data, we can test it in the cloud and measure all the different architectures and ways of doing things to find out what works optimally. And uh, we're also interested in using it to study the structure of markets. And that's something that Larry's very interested in. And one of the things we're experimenting with are using vector embeddings to represent the state of the market, including macroeconomic factors and all tradable assets, which is giving us some interesting results. That's really, that's really interesting. I, I want to start with, with, with Peter. You know, uh, you know, you're managing money. You know, 
you're using it in various aspects of, of the, the business in terms of how you think about managing money. Well, where do you think this is going? You know, certainly we can do little things here and there. Uh, do you think we'll get to a point where, where you know, we can actually tell it to structure a portfolio? Do you think we can tell it to, you know, it's time to, to buy the long bond or sell, you know, or sell uh, Apple stock or, you know, where do you think this goes? Let's talk about what you can already use it for, because I think we can kind of dream it's going to be useful for a lot of things. But I became aware of, of the real power of uh, AI maybe a, a little over five years ago um, when I realized that so much of the street was using AI and programs to uh, make markets. Um, the big areas uh, that we, I think we all know, the ETF has, uh, universe has been mushrooming. And the amount of trading associated with ETFs is just unbelievable. Um, and what you realize is that the market makers um, in the securities that kind of um, support these ETFs, um, it's almost all algorithmic. It's almost all using AI. They're using price feeds to um, implement like bids and offers based on certain parameters. And I just remember myself trying to buy an asset. Um, we didn't see it, particularly in fixed income. You don't see assets trade all the time. There's some of these dark pool and liquidity providers, um, and we'll occasionally see uh, a flash will go up that something's on the board. And if I'm interested, let's say, to pick up two million of a certain name, I remember one specific day where 500,000 was being offered, and my trader came to me and said, hey, I have an offer of 500,000. Do you want to buy it? And I said, how much did we want to buy? He said, two million. And he said, I said, ah, okay, go ahead. By the time he went, it was gone. It had been taken already. And that's because so many of the market makers have uh, algorithms and AI essentially uh, bidding and, uh, for assets and selling assets at certain prices. So what we realize it's already on the execution side. We have to compete with these um, players in terms of finding assets that we might want. So that was sort of like alerted us. But recently with the chat GPT phenomenon, I think it's important where you're going to immediately see this being rolled out which is um, consolidating research. And so I think like many people in this room since COVID, I get invited to like 20 webinars a day. I cannot physically make 20, I can't even do you know, a quarter of them. But what you can now do is record them. You can actually have uh, it being transcribed and then you could have it all summarized by a variety of AI products. And so what that absolutely allows you to do is synthesize enormous amounts of data that you just could not humanly do uh, before. Now then the question is, can we vault all of this uh, purported wisdom? And of course, what we learn from these webinars is it's like a 90 minute webinar gets boiled down to about a minute 45 worth of, of actual content. usable yeah. content. So it saves a lot of time, but eventually you'll be able to maybe uh, analyze this this webinar data that you're getting an opinion with um, market movement and seeing if there is actually some correlation or any of it could be useful to you know make some predictive investments. Um, but you're already sort of seeing little bits of it already processing information, saving you time, and also executing much faster than a human could execute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harry, you talked about synthetic data. Can you kind of you know go in a little? Is this is this just you know trying to you know synthesize kind of replay history, kind of change it a little bit so that you can kind of test and back test and you know put trading models under pressure or something like that? Or, or I don't quite understand this whole idea of synthetic. So there's data. two tracks that we're taking. The immediate track is really simple, and you can almost use ChatGPT out of the box for it. So we can you can describe. What you're trying to do, you have a bunch of people transferring money between banks and explain to them what the forms are, which, by the way, surprisingly knew the forms for SWIFT already and what the fields were. And you say, make up a bunch of names, a bunch of uh, transactions between $1 million and $100 million and generate 100,000 rows. And boom, we get it. Then we can put in patterns for money laundering. And oh, for like, like test data and stuff like test that. Data. Now, so that's one track. The other track is more complex, where we actually want to capture all the interrelationships between the assets. So for that, 
we tokenize returns and we normalize them. Uh, say the simple way would be dividing by their average volatility, but there are better ways, but I don't want to get too complicated now. And then you can get a string of tokens which represent, say, closing prices for the day if you're doing daily data. And that could be several thousand wide. And then you can train a transformer, which is the same technology behind the large language models, to guess what some of the data is if you mask it out, just like they train ChatGPT to learn language. And then it produces believable market simulations. It won't produce something which is like a random number generator would, where things didn't have the right correlation structure between them. But and the data looks more reasonable, and, and you, could, you could kind of yeah, not put only in surveillance tools and things like that. Exactly. Not only does it look reasonable, it looks so good that I showed it to some of our markets people, and they actually think it could be used for prediction. So it's exciting. Interesting. Interesting. Alice, let me bring you in here. You, you're working with a lot of your you know, clients at, at Google. And um, what, what are some of the things that you're seeing? Yeah, thanks, Larry. And thanks, everybody, for, for all your insights. Um, so obviously, we are, we're really the infrastructure of a lot of what our, our customers are doing. So a big area that we're really focused on, sort of twofold, is really creating an exchange for data. So an environment where our customers have easy access or more access to data. So you can come and use our data sets across the exchanges, customer data, um, and a really kind of a, a diverse exchange environment for our data. And then obviously overlay that with auto machine learning, a lot of the you know AI that we offer um, to help with your analytics. So it kind of creates sort of a, a democratized environment for your data. So on both sides of it, we have the exchanges and venues who are customers, the large exchanges. Obviously, we have a lot of uh, sell side and buy side customers. And this kind of creates an environment where all of these uh, participants can leverage and use multiple data, data sets. And this include retail data, data sets, geospatial, um, store buying, you know, everything. So it's, um, I think it's something that we're, we're really dedicated to and we're really evolving. And that's part of what, what we're trying to do here is, is create that um, sort of democratized environment for, for everyone to use. When when you have all that information, let's just say in a in you know some sort of Google store uh, storage um, mechanism, I assume the the you know the, the golden ring is to be able to intersect those those data sets together and you know you know mix geospatial and all sorts of different market data together to try to you know interpret or understand it. You know how far are we are that are, are, are or are we there in terms of doing that? Yeah, that's a great question, Larry. I think a lot of our customers, um, certainly some of the, the big uh, buy side firms are very interested in that. And they certainly saw uh, Google, uh, particularly in this analytics hub environment. So any of our customers that use BigQuery, which is sort of, you know, the foundational um, data play, um, can, can actually provision and access that data. So a lot of the buy side firms very early on saw the customer base that we had, the kind of data sets that were available and they've been doing those kind of um, overlay analyses for some time now where they're looking at geospatial, they're looking at retail, um, buying habits, um, you know, as well as some of the traditional data sets that you'd buy from some of the large exchanges. So it's become, you know, I think a very um, rich environment to, you know, kind of play around and then bring in the AI to kind of overlay, which everybody's been saying it's been in, on Wall Street for a long time, but I think some of these buy side firms are, are really kind of perfect, perfecting that intersection. Interesting. Hey, Jake, let's bring you in here. You, you're, you're certainly, um, you know, work for a super large exchange. Um, <laughs> that, that's true. And we, we I don't know if uh, the audience is all that familiar, but we, we purchased Refandiv. So those, all of that collection of data flows are part of our offering. Actually, to, to Allison's point, I, I, it, I'm not quite in that business, but I, I think our creation of data is, is in some ways outpacing our ability to understand that data, describe it, uh, even incorporate it into any sensible analysis. And a layer of AI is really about compressing and simplifying it and making it tangible to us. So that's just a follow-up to your point. Back to what I, what I do for a living, <laughs> our... Um, 
actually here, give, give me a slightly different prompt because is that, is that what you want me to talk about? I don't want this to just be a plug for the London Stock Exchange No, group. I, I think we want to work through everybody and then we'll get more towards more targeted questions. But like, uh, you know, the question is, you know, I, what kinds of things are you doing at L LSEG, you know, in the AI space and, and where, where sure. do you see it headed? Sure. So several years ago, we incorporated very heavily invested in natural language processing to clean up a bunch of our data flows. This is a, a relatively low controversy topic. Clean data, everyone's happy with it. Some of these techniques are about generating alternative data, new, unlocking new data sets that we could potentially sell. A couple years ago, we really experimented on our, sort of with our fixed income platform. Can we, can we actually sell the output of some of these models that are not econometric, in nature that have low explainability or explainability along the, the kind of the AI standards that a lot of people aren't comfortable with. And the answer still is in the fixed income space, it's pretty hard. And then now everyone wants to, large language models are the new shiny toy. I don't know if in two years from now that hype burns out, but I, I do believe a, mo, a design pattern of co-piloting where a large language model assists your everyday workflow, that, that is gonna stick around and be very impactful. And we're working towards enabling our flows, our tools, our products to have that sort of, that interface. Um, Barry, you know, when you start looking at large, large language models, what does that mean kind of in relationship to, you know, you know, some of the things that Peter was talking about, you know, you know more on the, you know, where the trading models where, where it's just, Trying to you know figure out what's the quote of IBM at this you know given second, you know is that is that a different kind of a, you know I, I think it's a different kind of AI you know it, it actually is and and thank you for that question because I was going to kind of uh, throw in my own question to the to the panel um, but I want I wanted to go back to the webinar question because I think it's it's actually pretty important. We spend a lot of time focusing on this. We look at the strategic level of these types of tools. And so we look at efficiency versus effectiveness. You know, efficiency is, are we doing things right? And effectiveness is, are we doing the right things? And there's a big difference between the two. So in your, your comment where you're talking about all the webinars and how you can't go through all the webinars, right? Efficiency, using the technology to be more efficient is being able to take these you know, two hour webinars and knocking them down to 90 seconds worth or writing them out or transcribing. But the more strategic side of it is getting the technology to say, which ones do I have to really listen to? Yeah, that absolutely is um, the case. And what's interesting is uh, for the time being, like you still want to have, uh, I think you, Jake, you called it a co-pilot, right? So you want to have your sort of AI tool. But you're going to want to have somebody there to say, um, actually, looking through this, this was important in this webinar. Most of this webinar was not that important. This one was important. And then be able to somehow um, build that into your uh, LLMs, right? Trying to be able to have some kind of filtering, human filtering, which will um, help you even further. So yes, now you've got these tw 20 webinars that have been boiled down to a couple of minutes each. But then the real question is, are any of them any good? Who, where, where, where really is the is the value. Um, and then also sometimes you might want to then take the time to sort of go back to the source and actually say like, is it completely explaining it the way, you know, uh, uh, is the AI explaining it the way uh, I would maybe understand it. Um, so this process I would imagine, is gonna take years to kind of keep ping ponging back between, is it effective? Is it getting better? Um, I'm assuming that the technologies really are there, uh, have the ability to kind of improve, but they really do need human intervention for the improvements. I, I agree completely. And to get back to your, your question, Larry, about large language models, it all depends on what's in your large, what's your data set? Because um, data sets are different. And how do you know, as a, as a PM, how do you know what data set is being used to come to the decision on which of these things to listen to or which security to get into or which security to get out of or whatever. Um, you know, there's, those are big issues. Is the large language model, is it 
all free data is in copyrighted data. Uh, there's an ethics level. Is some of it um, non-public information? That's a good one. That'll keep all your compliance people happy for a long time. Um, you know, so there are all kinds of different nuances there. And, uh, you know, I forget the being in your question, but I'll, I'll stick with him is that I don't think you're ever going to replace the human. You're going to use these technologies to support the human decisions. The but I don't think you'll ever replace them. Yeah. Uh, Allison and Barry, you know, uh, 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 or Barry, Allison and Jake, uh, Barry brings up a really interesting point um, around IP. Um, and given you know you're you're an exchange uh, and and part of TR um, own a lot of IP, uh, Allison, you know you've got a lot of technology that's looking at it. How do you how do you start thinking about managing that? You know, uh, clearly I I would assume that that if I run a model that uses you know refinitive data, uh, you know you'd like to get compensated for that, Allison. Um, you, you want to try to democratize this as much as you can. I, I assume, you know, that becomes an issue. If I can't get access to refinitive data, then how, how does my model work? I, well, I don't know. I, I don't think Alice and I are necessarily in total conflict. I mean, you, you also sell compute, and there's ways, technological ways, to kind of protect our IP. This this question comes up all the time. Clients don't want to, you know, they, they don't want to share their special sauce. They don't want to share their positions. They don't want to share their analyses. Yet they want a lot of services around them. They want efficiency. They want debugging that's very fast. And it comes back to, well, tell us what you ran and how you ran it. So we use a lot of on-site, off-site. We use a lot of um, client deployments. And we, we lean on technology to kind of protect IP. Um, there's some give and take. As these large language models proliferate, the more data you feed it, the more precise it's going to get. If clients want that kind of precision, they're going to have to, in some capacity, share their data. Yeah, I, the Federal Reserve is concerned about this. It's one of the um, issues which come come up when we talk about using uh, language models. We have a communications and outreach group that is very um, determined to use them because it takes them a lot of time to translate something from our economist blog. We have something called the Liberty Street blog where we have these detailed economic papers. And they would like to change it to something that looks like a weather forecast on our website about the economy. And we did this. And we had to convince people that we weren't taking IP from anyone but because the blog originated at the Fed. And the only concern was when it was translating it to simpler language, would it borrow from something else? And we looked over it and we were convinced that it was okay. But in general, it's a problem. If you wanted to publish something and you wanted to ask a question and have it create an answer, where did that answer come from? Sometimes the ideas can be traced back to sources. So this is why they're interested in more of the, uh, you know, the RAG paradigm, the retrieval augmented generation, where you can see where the ideas are coming from. And in that case, you may, for IP, have some kind of you know, payment or compensation system put in place. We were sort of joking about this the other day and said, well, maybe Amazon should have a service where you could put any book you have on your Kindle into their rag for questions and answers. But uh, somehow this will have to be worked out. Allison? Yeah. So obviously for data like Refinitiv or any of the big exchanges that want to list it, that's obviously a permission-based activity. So both on the side of the provider of the data and then obviously in the recipient. So you have to be given, you know, provision, you know, to have that access to that data. But I think that you also really raise a great point here, Larry, is around uh, governance and a real commitment to governance. And I think that continues to be, uh, is going to continue to be a topic around both the data data sets and accessibility to that, as well as obviously as we go forward in AI is because that trust in data is the foundation of all of this, you know, and the, the for, for both the buy side, sell side, and then obviously all the, the cloud vendors, the hyperscalers, as, as people call us, you know, to make sure that the integrity of the data is, and we have, you know, we also have the strong governance and process. So I was talking a little bit about this um, exchange that we have called Analytics Hub, um, and I think it's it's definitely a you know multilateral you know kind of commitment to the quality of the data being provided and a and a governance. So I know all of us who come, I you know came from the street. I was a trader. Like you know, obviously 
we're all very you know tied and wedded to our data, but the the commitment to the governance around that I think is really essential in in, in the coming years and and really having um, you know I think a a commitment to uh, not only the technology that pr that provides that, but to you know leadership that believes in that because I think that that's going to be really the foundation for all of us to to trust one another as we move forward. Peter, I, I, I assume that's got to be really important when you're making an investment decision. You know, if I if I'm asking ChatGPT to to do some analysis, you kind of want to know if it's you know you know some Joe Schmo putting out the information or somebody who's actually knows what they're talking about. I don't, I don't know. Well. This is interesting because this question of democratization, like you might have a, a tool like ChatGPT that everybody has access to, but at the end of the day, these models all work off of information. And a lot of the information that we get is proprietary, right? We pay for it. Um, you happen to work for an organization that's quite, yeah. quite protective of the information. Yeah, I think we and are. Can you imagine how any model that would make some financial predictions um, if it doesn't have access to your database and all of your information, how accurate or good can it really be? And so at the end of the day, these models have to feed off of information and the quality of the information um, really is gonna determine how good the model is. And so, um, you know, as much as we talk about democratization, I still see it as more um, this kind of arms race where we're gonna have the biggest asset managers, um, the most profitable ones, have access to a lot more information than, let's say, a smaller manager. Um, and so, um, you know, you do worry about this sort of um, tyranny that incumbents might have, particularly as asset management becomes a more consolidated industry, is that um, you really may not be able to democratize. In fact, it might become a very undemocratic environment, particularly for individuals who will never be able to uh, uh, have the resources to be able to make the kind of decisions that, that we think these AI systems can, can do. They won't have access to the information. They already don't have access to a lot of this information, but you can imagine it only getting worse in the future. Harry? Yeah, I was going to say, um, specifically since you brought up Bloomberg, Bloomberg does protect themselves for this. They have a product that I wanted to train a model on. And it was called their events news alert system. It's a very premium system already. It's quite expensive. So only elite funds can, can afford it. And they, when I told our legal department that we were going to try training a model on it because we wanted to see uh, you know, how tradable the information was and, and do some analytics. We had limitations of what we could do contractually and we ended up not doing it. We evaluated it and found that it was, uh, it was quite useful, but couldn't be used for training. So you can buy it if you want to use it. And I think that's fair. I mean, I was a little bit of annoyed at the time because I, I was looking forward to using it. But. There's some really interesting parallels going on here. I, I think, you know, when, when uh, you know, I think many of you were around when the internet kind of, you know, started out, you know, in, in, uh, and everybody thought, oh, access to the internet, that's going to, you know, break down a lot of the silos, it's going to democratize the world, and you're going to have all these different, you know, websites, and each one is as easy to get to as the other, and what do we find out? You know, it consolidates back to, to the Googles, or to the Charles Schwabs of the world, or to the large players, and then this whole idea of democratization actually... I wouldn't say it doesn't work, or but but this I think people like brands. People, you know, trust is still important. Um, you know, we trust Google, we trust Amazon, we trust Charles Schwab or whoever. You know, and and I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, Jake looks like you wanna. This does seem to be the natural tendency. There's a very large infrastructural layout, a huge a huge investment that these companies need to make to sustain and provide these services, and it's going to consolidate. So I, I don't see a. a I don't see a force that's going to break it up necessarily. And even, even if there's some disruptor, they'll very quickly be absorbed by one of the dominant players to capture that rent. I, I'll, I'll take the contrarian view there, being the, <laughs> being the small vendor, uh, the, small, the small boutique vendor. Uh, I disagree that more is better. I do believe that better is better. And uh, we've made a business over 20 years of working with you know, very 
high-end market makers, hedge funds, and folks like that who want the best and face it. You know, in investment management, it's about getting an edge and not doing what everybody else does, having something that's a little bit better. I mean, that goes back to, you know, the Trojan War thousands of years ago. Having slightly better data will give you a better result. And so, um, well, I'll stop there. No, no. Well, I, I think we'd, everybody would agree, but the real question is, is all data good all the time? And one of the things we've, real, we've learned, if you've been on the street long enough, there are going to be at points in time where certain data is more valuable than others and there's cyclicality to it. And then the question is, well, how many of these data sources are you able to buy and know when to be switching to different factor analysis and things like that? So I completely agree. There's always going to be an interesting market for folks like you who are generating interesting, unique data. My kids are data. relatively well fed. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but then the real question is, how many of these can you subscribe to? They're often over time. I'm just even thinking of offline information services. And uh, I'm so old, like I was around at the time when you used to get newsletters or uh, uh, weekly, uh, you know, sort of things that were sent uh, in the mail, like the snail mail, um, and some were better than others, and some were really good for certain periods of time, and others are better at other periods of time. So that I don't think ever changes, right? Like that's always going to probably be the case, and there's always going to be um, an opportunity for new data providers to kind of say, hey, we have an interesting way to look at data or we're capturing an interesting thing that we don't think other people are. And yeah, you know, you might have to try that and kind of incorporate it into your AI. If you, if you think of like your AI as being like just the operating system, right? And then all these other kind of pipes that are feeding information into it to you know, sort of applications, then you can then kind of customize. Um, it's kind of a never ending process, I think, of continually looking for data, continually improving, trying to so that's really interesting. So, so you know, theoretically, um, you know, your, your AI model. So, if each of us were running the same AI model, depending upon you know how we access it, how we think, how we ask questions, we would wind up getting different answers. Um, and also, is that is that kind of how you you think about it? And and does this you know almost be this whole idea of everybody consolidating into one you know huge database AI model is probably not going to be the one that the model that actually survives. It's going to be everybody looking at it a little bit differently. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure everybody's heard there's a whole new field of prompt engineering. So it's all about the prompt, right? It's all about the questions you ask and how you shape it and kind of how you're informed by that question. And that, that really draw, drives the model uh, a great deal. So that, that kind of convergence, I think, is probably less likely unless everybody is your brain is removed and everybody is uh, asked the same kind of questions, has the same perspective. I think it has a lot to do with, you know, what your, you know, even back to, you know, early days trading strategies before uh, a lot of this is like kind of what is your market position? What are you, you know, what are you, what are you seeing in your data sets and the news and the overlay that you've, you've, you've done for yourself um, in your own preparation? And, you know, it's all about the kind of questions that you ask. Interesting. Harry? And, and another area where I think we should have some caution is in the whole area of appropriate use. For example, uh, surveillance uh, is becoming more efficient with AI. So yeah, the I, you know, Wall Street was on last night. I was watching, you know, I was, I was thinking blue was a blue, you know, blue, uh, whatever, you know, uh, like Sandicott's, you know, whatever paper. You know, it's like. I, I didn't see that, but. What I, what I have been uh, hearing people talk about is being able to follow uh, companies both by the general social media postings of their employees and segregating it by company as well as looking at sea level. And for example, you could monitor executives at a pharma, a pharma mm -hmm. company that has a drug that's gotten back an answer from the FDA, but it's still secret. But by looking at the psychometrics of their posts, you can, with a lot of accuracy, figure out what happened. And sometimes you don't need that much accuracy. There have been posts of these people in the, buying luxury cars and in expensive restaurants. <laughs> or it could be just in the way they express themselves. Uh, you can Peter, follow oh. geolocation data, find out if someone's sick. Are they going to a hospital specialized in cancer? 
And is that a negative uh, indicator for the stock? And people aren't thinking about this stuff. And I don't, how do we regulate it? Should this be considered insider trading at a certain point when it becomes too invasive? And I think it's something we have to think about. I think maybe um, the underlying question here about like, is AI going to replace humans? I think the more interesting um, perspective is to think of AI as really augmenting human intelligence. Think of it as kind of like a, a farmer who uses a combine, right? Like you can go out there with hose and shovels and how much land can you really till in a day, right? right. But you get on one of those big shiny you know, John Deere combines and suddenly you can do multiples uh, of what you would have done otherwise. And I think that's really what we should be viewing, at least in the short term, that AI is here to be like a tool for human intelligence. It's, it's there for you to uh, make decisions, hopefully with better information, calling through a bunch of stuff um, that you might not be able to have time to do. And um, I think that that in itself, if you just position and think of it as augmenting human intelligence, well, then suddenly you would start asking very, very not different so questions, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And not fearing it, but just sort of saying, well, how, how, can I, how can I use this piece of, of machinery to help my job and make me do better things every day, right? Yeah. Prove performance. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. Your, 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 your question that said, you know, we're all going to pump in specific data to maybe even the exact same AI system and get different answers. You, you could consider that a bug of this system. I actually consider it a feature where that an augmented human who understands it, that, that enhances their edge. They become more competitive. And, and that is going to be the landscape of AI. It's not, it's not a, a bot replacing the human. It's a human augmented, a human plus AI that really takes over the investment management, the data cleaning, the, the systems generation. So where similar, you, we've, we've seen this in chess, right? Right. Remember when, you know, what is it now? It's 26 years since, you know, uh, Kasparov was beaten. But you would think like, who, what human wants to play chess anymore? But actually, chess has become more popular than it's ever been. You have team chess, what they call centaur chess, where you have uh, teams of people and their computers play other people and their computers. Um, and that, to me, actually seems like a very good image of what investment management is going to be in the future. So where does, where does this start out? Um, do, we, do we, you know, we already have robos that kind of, you know, help. Uh, you, know, in, you know, individual investors structure portfolios. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I'm not sure Berkshire Hathaway is going to, you know, change, you know, its stripes tomorrow. Um, do you think it starts out in the retail space with with helping individuals manage portfolios? Does it? Does you know? Do we wind up with? Well, with it's certainly it's already done that, right? Robo mm -hmm. advisors are just basically taking a survey, you know, like of of information and turning that into an allocation. But is that, right? you know, there's a difference, but I, I think there's a difference between putting it in kind of a templ template, t templated, you know, format and, and, and a kind of more sentient, you know, object or whatever, figuring out how, how, how Allison or Jake or Barry or, you know, his portfolio should be different than, you know, each other. Well, it's primitive, but uh, we do sort of, you have little glimpses of how it could function. I mean, people have been using optimizers, right? Mm -hmm. But optimizers always have to be optimized to something, and that's always the human input, right? So you have an optimizer that's basically augmenting the decision-making process, but you sort of still need a human to say, I want you to optimize for yield or volatility or a variety of things, right? Um, Baron. So um, if, you, if you look at this at a, at a market level, it's not any different than way, ways technologies get uh, introduced into technologies in general. You start, on, there, there's an info on the bottom side because it's pretty simplistic types of applications. And you come in from the top side because they have all the investment money to go and spend on it. And you kind of, and, and the applications begin to pop out and the use cases begin to pop out on both sides, on the low end and on the high end. And it's the middle the second tier that it tends to be the last one in. Um, you know, I read an article yesterday, the day before yesterday, I forget where it was, maybe on Bloomberg, who knows, I don't know. But um, it, 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 the, just, the just of it was that they let these AI models loose on, on simulated you know, trading models. 
and they wound up doing nefarious things. Like it, it realized that if I can, you know, you know, pump this up or, or spoof this and do that, um, Harry, I, I assume, you know, being, you know, kind of working for a regulator, that's got to, you know, kind of worry you, you know, or, or I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes up with people right away. I used to work in high frequency trading. So you figure you can push the market a certain way. The first trick people learned was to cancel orders. And right. then they all started doing this. And then I was working for, uh, in both, both trading and in technology. The company said, well, can you give us one button to do that? Or, and they wanted to have algorithms. You wanted the spoof through. button? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we gave them, they call it the monster button. But anyway, <laughs> and then there are rules against it. So the regulators come out after the fact and say, you can't do this, you can't do this. And hopefully you can... Uh, limit that kind of behavior because certainly the trading firm, unless they change the law, still has to be responsible for the trades they do, whether it comes from a machine or from a person. But I think what will make a big difference isn't that, but, but being able to understand the complex interrelationships between what's going on in the market. When I was a, a quant, which I did for over a decade, we would try to figure out some relationships uh, you know, the first thing that was really big was the whole stat arb and mean reversion thing, and then it got more complicated from that. But at a certain point, you couldn't handle more complexity because both your, your, your brain as well as the equipment that you had, there was too much of a data problem to capture interrelationships between everything. But this is the promise of machine learning, that it can be exposed to data, and it can pick up those complex interrelationships. And... I, people are experimenting with it. I'm not saying it's effective yet, but I think it's got a lot of promise. And, and I think that that will lead to a more sophisticated trading pattern, particularly if you combine that <laughs> with other things such as automated, uh, you know, sort of shredding of all the SEC documents like the 10Ks to develop supply chain and relationships and so on and so forth. So you can see building this huge multivariable model, which would just be much more precise and wouldn't miss things uh, several levels deep. Much like ch playing chess, how many levels deep you can go, the better you are. And I think trading will be impacted that way. Interesting. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, we're running out of time. Um, um, you know, final thoughts. Where, 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 you know, where do you think, that, you know, how long... How long till a lot of these tools are kind of embedded in, in all our organizations? I don't know. Um, Allison, you're, you're working with, with firms. Do you, you think this is, you know, are we hit here now or, or will this be another five or seven years or I don't know? I th yeah, I think we're, we're here now. I think there's a lot, of, a lot of testing happening, obviously, you know, across the regulators and, and across the firms, the big exchanges, obviously, I think. Everybody is um, is is really both invested in terms of their own kind of transformation, you know, in, in this area. And obviously, um, I think to Peter's point, you know, this arms race concept. I think there's this kind of you know who who can get there first. And certainly, um, I know everybody uses one comment um, or one provider for AI, but obviously there are there are others um, out there. Um, I'm really interested also in this topic around this sort of uh, surveillance and kind of where that comes in. I think that was a really um, can, should continue to be a, a big area for us to focus on and kind of when that becomes insider trading or when that kind of insight um, sort of alerts a different kind of path. So I think there's sort of the, the good and the potential risks um, in this. But I would say that, um, you know, through through the analytics hub that we offer. And, you know, I know we didn't really cover that here, but certainly around blockchain data has also become very, um, you know, a big topic, you know, collecting that data, making that data available. So when I talk about, you know, the availability of data, I'm talking about it kind of any type of data that you want to think about, that exchange is going to provide that. And I, I see a real um, very high level engagement of that. Yeah. Jake, you know. So I, I agree. I, I think we are there. And, we are we are certainly encouraging our customers and enabling these sorts of interfaces for user experience, for user quality, to alleviate pain points, to improve our internal efficiencies. I don't know how far it's going to go, though. So right now, it's very simple prompts. It's very kick off basic workflows. The, the next few steps of can this 
really manage a complicated orchestration, multiple layers down in the investment through some sort of basic interactions with natural language. So you put in a few sentences and it kicks off a huge complicated analysis. Uh, we're working towards it. I, I think in the next few years, we'll get an answer whether or not that's even possible. Interesting. Baron? Two part answer. Part one is I do believe we are there now. Part two is over my 40 year career, I can tell you that the definition of there has changed considerably and will continue to change. Uh, I would agree. I think, first of all, we are there. Um, the real question is whether or not people today are harnessing what AI can do for you today. And so I gave you some examples about um, you know, sifting through webinars or, or, uh, or creating optimizers. But what it really says is that the way that we've probably been staffing in the investment management space needs to change. A lot of teams would be far more uh, valuable if they had uh, coders on their team embedded in what they do with their domain expertise than hiring another two analysts to cover different markets. You really do want to figure out how can you start thinking about um, using AI to help you do what you do every day. Interesting. And Harry, I, I, you know, get you, give you the last word, given your okay. quant background, you're kind of, I, I, guess, I assume your background is kind of almost like that. If you worked at, at you know, uh, an HFT type firm, yeah. you know, it wasn't just, you know, the traders here, the programmers there, they're, you know, very much uh, embedded. Is that, is that kind of how the future rolls out? Well, let me give two parts to the, this answer. For the high frequency part, I think we're going to have something like uh, Kahneman introduced this concept of thinking fast and thinking slow. For high frequency trading, AI is nowhere near the microsecond decision ranges, which is what you need for that. But I think AI could be used to adjust the parameters of the simple system that's trading to know when it's in different regimes and to do different things adaptively and give an improvement. But I think there's a much bigger issue here, which is what I want to say for the second part of my answer, which is... Uh, you can't, it's, I mean, it's a cliche, but I'm going to say it anyway. You can't give everyone above average returns. <laughs> so no matter what How we come? do, <laughs> so no I... matter what we do, it's all going to be, you know, you know measure, countermeasure, measure, countermeasure, measure, countermeasure, because it's a competitive game in terms of trading. However, investment doesn't have to be. So I think we have to focus on re raising what that average is by using AI intelligently to make corporations uh, more productive. And this is a challenge. We have, you know, people keep saying, where is the productivity increase in technology? And it can be measured different ways. And I'm not gonna comment on the different ways to measure it. But sometimes it tends not to pay off as much as people would think. And in other areas, it pays off in ways which can't be measured, such as the way we can all communicate globally instantly. You can try to put a price on that. And if you put a price on that, what it cost to make a long distance phone call, when I was a child, it would be in the trillions, right? But, <clears throat> so it's hard to say, but I think we can, we need to focus on just making things better with AI, producing more useful things that people need and improving the quality of life. And with that, I think we are out of time. I want to thank my, my esteemed panel. Um, thank you, Larry. That was a really good discussion. Thank you.